Hello and welcome to another episode of the Small Gold Subscribers Sound Off. Today we have a returning guest, Ann Rem. And today we're going to be talking about a recent article that he has produced in-depth analysis of Bitcoin, Litecoin, Lightning Network, and cross-atomic swaps to become one. We're going to talk about the debates and how they've been resolved so far about scaling the Bitcoin network. We're going to talk about how Litecoin factors in. We're going to, in passing, talk about Bitcoin Cash, block size, the Lightning Networks, the pros and the cons. And then we're going to hit on some of the more corporate solutions to payment processing with Bitcoin, Litecoin, and the like. So, so lots of information here. We've got somebody who's done a great analysis in this blog post. So, and how are you doing today? Hello, Lewis. Glad to be back again. Well, it's good to have you back. And uh, this is a very timely recording because we've now had a year and you had gone through what happened to bring us up to that year or so when we had the split between Bitcoin with a fork and Bitcoin Cash. So what I'd like to do is for you to give us the background of how we got to the point where we had the split, the fork, forming Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, which Roger Ver tries to call Bitcoin, Bitcoin Core, and that Bitcoin Cash is somehow Bitcoin. But if you give us the background there, what were the issues? Not not discussing the personal issues between the parties, but more the the scaling issue was really the big thing that was Bitcoin had become a a product of its uh, or a victim of its own success and there was this issue with scaling so can you give us the background and then just take it away and take us through all the way up to today where we are bringing in block size off chain litecoin testbed all that kind of stuff so go ahead easy one to start then <laughs> <laughs> um well you know bitcoin started in 2009 um satoshi released the white paper then he released the code and then Mostly he and Hal Finney worked on Bitcoin in the early days. But you have um, early correspondence really from around 2010, 2011 from Satoshi and Hal Finney discussing this concept of um, second layer networks or, or a layer to work on top of Bitcoin. Because, you know, the, the, the major problem, if you want to call it that, with Bitcoin is that um because it's um to, to to maintain its decentralization you must make it as uh, cheap and cost effective as possible to run the software so you can validate the transactions so um that means that bitcoin only has a one megabyte uh, base block size which limits it to um i think it's roughly seven transactions per second so if you understand anything about how bitcoin operates and in how its block size is limited and there is a competition for for block space which you know um runs us into a fee market so so for example you know many altcoins have been pitched like um the the, the newer and better bitcoin because they have no fees but the th the thing is that um if you if you're going to have transactions then um well for bitcoin anyway it it it, it has to carry a fee because there's this you know competition for limited block space so um um things things were you know smooth sailing in the early days there was hardly any transactions and therefore there were hardly any fees you know bitcoin wasn't worth much but as it grew you know it, it had spurts of um merchant adoption in in 2012 and 2013 but it's really when it started going past you know from a hundred dollars to a thousand dollars that this business of fees came up but th these were fees priced in dollars not in you know in bytes so um th you know the, the the bigger bitcoin becomes and the greater the value of its currency then by nature that the greater the value of the transaction then the more fees you're going to have on the network so that you know there's 
from nearly from day one, there's been this discussion about the need to scale Bitcoin so that you know it can be as cheap and convenient as possible for you know the, the most amount of people. Right. So. This this really brings us to the Bitcoin scaling debate, which was as it you know uh, as the term as you think of the term, it's 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 the need to scale. So there's 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 no argument in the Bitcoin community about the need to scale. The the, the big ad- argument was which method we were going to use to scale. Right. And the, this is, um, you know this 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 goes back to Mike Hearn and some of the others who um, were pushing for bigger base block sizes. So this this kind of raged 2014-2015. You had Bitcoin XT and um, uh, I can't remember what the other one was called. Bitcoin Classic, I think. So these were really early attempts to increase Bitcoin's block size. It, it was eventually fought off, you know, Bitcoin XT and um, Bitcoin Classic didn't get much traction. But when we were coming up to, well, so, so so they kind of failed. And then, you know, the Bitcoin Core developer team came up with SegWit, which was originally supposed to be a fix for transaction malleability, which which had plagued Bitcoin in, in the early years. So, so they now, developed. You, excuse me. Can you explain yeah. SegWit what it means, SegWit witness, and transaction malleability for our listeners? Right. Yeah. So, t- transaction malleability means that um, you can malleate. They call it, which is you can't really reverse the transaction, but you can fiddle about by malleating the the transaction signature, and so you can jam and spam the network. And you know, Mt. Gox, for example, blamed the meltdown on. Um, transaction malleability so it it, you know it was a pain and it was a problem and it stopped us from uh, bitcoin from developing second layer effects you know the 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 ones i've um, briefly touched upon already so the the core developer team while also they you know i think the core developer team understand that to make Bitcoin as anti-fragile and censorship resistant as possible, that we have to maintain this small block size. So so their proposed method of scaling was segregated witness. So to, to remove this problem of transaction malleability, if you take the signature out of the block, so you, Bitcoin transactions go into a block size. So what they proposed was taking <coughs> the signature out of the block. So segregating the signature or the witness, so so that's what SegWit was basically all about. But you know, when you take the signature out of the block um, with SegWit, um, because the transaction signature takes up more than half of the block space, once you've taken that out, that is an automatic block size um, increase. So what you've been seeing since SegWit is more than one megabyte blocks, you know, because this is, you know, this is an example of the ingenuity of the core developer team in that once we got SegWit. But let's let's stop before you go on on SegWit. Wasn't there a debate over whether to do SegWit or not? And because some were concerned about it and doesn't Litecoin fit into this story somehow? Uh, Yeah. But I'll, I'll just quickly describe um, a bit more on SegWit first. Okay. So, um, s- s- so you you change really with SegWit, it changed from block size to block weight, which uh, by stripping this transaction out of the out of the block, you could get more transactions in. So what you've been seeing since segregated witness was activated is more than one megabyte blocks. So you know. Big blockers didn't really want to talk about SegWit as a block size increase, but it was. Anyway, so yeah, um, the core developer team proposed SegWit and um, a lot of uh, big mining and corporate actors in Bitcoin um, did, did, did not go for it straight away because, you know, they, they wanted different solutions and they wanted to increase the block size directly. So this led to 
um, nearly two years of wrangling, really. Um, you had all threats of all type from um, mostly it was Bitmain and um, Roger Ver really did not like Segwit for some some sort of reason. So you know, I I was pretty aware of things back then, and that's why I dedicated nearly all of 2017 to um, really write about. The, the scaling debate and, and you know how it was going to play out so it, I did a post in June, June of 2017 where I predicted that um, well if we rewind a, a bit back first um, in April of 2017 uh, Charlie Lee uh, the creator of Litecoin um, decided really that he was going to try and accelerate this the stagnation because you know they, they try they'd been trying to get segwit for nearly two years and because you needed a, a soft um, minor activated soft fork to execute segwit and upgrade the code the miners would not allow this um, they would not basically execute the soft fork so they had to be forced to do it because um, <laughs> another thing if you understand some of the game theory of Bitcoin is that um, different players basically have different leverage over each other. So you have basically users, developers, and miners, and they all they all work on this Mexican standoff, and you know nobody will buckle. And then, but also if you understand Bitcoin, you understand that it's ultimately the users that have supremacy and can basically force the miners to do what they want if you push them hard enough. So what Charlie did was. Um, he instigated talk of this UASF, which is an user-activated soft fork, which, you know, it can't it, it can't really happen because <laughs> a soft fork has to be activated by the miners. But this UASF, you know, it shook up the um, the, the mining um, the mining pools and cartels within Litecoin so much that they decided to have um, a roundtable meeting between. You know Charlie and some of the big mining powers and some of the developers, and they they unilaterally decided that they would ex they would execute the miner activated soft fork to activate Segwit on Litecoin, which, as I put in my post, I found very very <laughs> curious at the time. So Charlie basically made sure that we got Segwit on Litecoin, and that then led to you know, it gave ideas for the Bitcoin community on how to get Segwit on Bitcoin. Well, now hold so on, I, for our listeners, just so they understand, what is Litecoin, and why was that a place to test out the the the, the Segwit? There is Litecoin very similar to Bitcoin. Yeah, like Litecoin is the most similar coin to Bitcoin. I, I I'm not sure if it's the actually the second oldest, but it's certainly the second most successful oldest um coin has been around since 2011 and you know charlie forked off the litecoin code to create bitcoin and he tweaked the uh, some stuff you know I've, I've listened to charlie and he's, i'm sorry uh, the other way around sorry i think you said that he he created bitcoin by forking off litecoin oh so he, yeah he, well he forked off litecoin from the original from, bitcoin yes. code yeah, so it's basically a, it's almost a clone. It's, of it's, the code it's a clone of Bitcoin, but with a little you different know, security. I, I've listened to Charlie in some of his interviews, and you know he says himself the reason why he created Litecoin was that he thought that Bitcoin could never scale. Um, could that Bitcoin would run into scaling problems? So he kind of dis, um, designed Litecoin as a support vehicle to Bitcoin. So he, you know, he's the, the the block confirmation times on Bitcoin, for example, are ten minutes. Well, the block confirmation times on Litecoin are two and a half minutes. So it, it's it's four times faster. It has four times the transaction capacity, and it has four times the rate of issue of currency. So Bitcoin has a maximum cap of twenty one million, and Litecoin has a maximum cap of eighty four million. So so they're very they're very similar, and you know, as Charlie said, he's basically designed. Um, Litecoin as Bitcoin's little brother and it was the little brother who first got Segwit and then 
you you know we, we're going into the middle of 2017 now and there was a lot of tension and leverage and all sorts of stuff going on you know there was i was on twitter during that time and and the crypto crypto twitter was was going nuts but um in the end um it was possible <clears throat> the same as with on litecoin you know the the bitcoin users ran these i, I can't remember how much it was, something like 800 uasf nodes user activated soft fork nodes so that that in the end forced bitmain and you know whoever else was trying to stall segwit to basically capitulate and then they signaled for uh, the segwit soft fork at the end of august and then we had to wait three weeks until segwit was finally enshrined i think it was the 22nd of august 2017. so you know the the, the scaling the scaling debate for all intents and purposes i you know people talk that there will be many more um forks and uh, scaling problems in the future but i think that segwit was by far the biggest you know the biggest thing to happen to bitcoin really because it's a massive upgrade and in the process you shut up where well, you you basically reduced bitmain's control over the mining pool and you know roger Ver's near enough being discredited now so in the in their last last act of uh, spite i think they fucked off bitcoin cash directly after we got segwit and you know they, they made the point of removing segwit and kind of ch crudely chopping it out before they they, they fucked off um bitcoin cash so basically so bitcoin cash's original quote vision was just make the block sizes bigger and then not even have segwit if they needed it in the future and yeah hadn't segwit what, what you're saying i think it sounds like segwit already solved the scaling issue for the time being and then they forked off bitcoin cash with the bigger block size yeah i think it was eight eight megabyte blocks and they chopped you know you know the, the reason segwit was developed as a fix for transaction malleability so there is no fix for transaction malleability on bitcoin cash right which means that they're gonna have the same problems that bitcoin had before segwit and they'll never be able to you know effectively scale second layer solutions so bitcoin's cash is the is only answer to the scaling debate is scaling linearly and that means scaling on the block which just you know it hurts um if if you look at i think half half the nodes of bcash uh out of some kind of um uh chinese server farm in china <laughs> So you know, there's nobody actually running Bitcoin Cash nodes, and I, and I doubt if they really could anyway, because you know, the bigger the, the bigger the block size, the the more resources you need to be able to validate the transactions, which you know is another reason I think they were after big blocks, which was to centralize Bitcoin, because if if you can right. make you know you know hardware and software, you're seeing the same same problem on ethereum at the moment it's nearly impossible now to sync an ethereum blockchain off a laptop you need specialist hardware and software so it, it just puts it out of the reach of more people whereas you know i i run a bitcoin um node on my on my laptop mm -hmm. it's eight years old it's it's memory is terrible but i can still run a bitcoin node and you know i i, I update it every day so well, so th th this is you know to to make sure that Bitcoin maintains decentralization and anti-fragility. You need to make sure that as many people as possible can run the software. So, you know, the government can't shut down. It, it, you know, if, if Bcash, say, had a thousand, a thousand people running a node, then the government could shut shut down, easily shut down a thousand people. But right. if you have a hundred thousand people running a node in, you know, 200 different countries, it's, 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 becomes practically impossible to shut down bitcoin okay so let's say now <clears throat> we've solved the pushing aside the malleability issue which segwit also sol solved but the, the scalability but let's say we now we get into a situation where we have 10 times the transactions 20 times the transactions 100 times the transactions that would argue that on the b 
Bcash side, you just have to keep increasing the size of the blocks. But what happens, and that doesn't make much sense, but what happens over on the Bitcoin side, is SegWit enough or is that where Lightning Networks comes in? Yeah, Se Se SegWit will never be enough, you know. It, I think with removing <coughs> the tr um, transactions out of the block that you can possibly get a maximum block weight now of two and a half megabytes, which is, you know, two and a half times what the original block weight of one megabyte was. So it's it's effectively doubled, more than doubled its transaction base. But still, you know, I, I think you you may be talking 20 transactions per second. So, you know, if, if, if we're talking about Bitcoin becoming a world reserve currency or a medium of exchange, then you, you're going to need much more than 20 right. transactions per second. But, you know, the, what, what the most important thing for Bitcoin developers and, you know, hardcore libertarian users is to make sure that, that, that the base layer is as decentralized as possible, which means a small block size. So, you know, our solution, if you like, to Bitcoin scaling problem is moving up a layer and into second layer effects, such as the Lightning Network. So L Lightning Network is a protocol that works on top of Bitcoin, and it's really anchored by Bitcoin, but you can transact off, off the Bitcoin the Bitcoin chain, which, you know, it takes you out of Bitcoin's 10 minute confirmation times. It takes you out of um, um, having to timestamp every transaction you do on the blockchain. And it takes you out of the fee market, which, you know, so, so if you move Bitcoin up second layer, you can have anon anonymous transactions. You can have instantaneous transactions and you can have virtually zero cost transactions. So, you know, this is a really the developing of Bitcoin as a competitor for payment processing, which you could never do on the base layer. So when that happens, how does the transaction, if it's not being recorded on the blockchain at the time, how does Lightning Networks sort that out? Well, there's, um, it's, it, it's, there's quite an interesting analogy with banking the history of gold and with banking, which I put in my post. So, you know, gold started off as as money, um, <clears throat> the best commodity for for store of value, medium of exchange and unit of account. But, you know, still because, um, gold was seen more as a store of value. And when you're talking the rise of civilization and deflation, then um, what you also have is the rise of banking so you know I'd, I'd call banking as well as being a scam I'd call it um, a, really a, a payment processing layer so you know you you hold gold in your vaults gold and silver in your vaults and then you on top you pledge paper tickets or banknotes but you know that they are basically only derivatives of the gold and silver in the vault but you know, paper is much cheaper to subdivide and, you know, ink and stamp than, than it would be to to try and divide um, gold bars or gold coins. So <clears throat> this is this is the, you know, the genesis of banking really to scale gold more as a medium of exchange and unit of account than the underlying precious metals. And this, I, I you know, there's few analogies I can think that are better than banking and gold to to explain you know this concept of lightning. So you have Bitcoin's base layer, and I think there's eight. Uh, there's going to be 18 million coins issued now, but you know the maximum cap of Bitcoin is 21 million um, currency units. Right. <clears throat> so you know if you if you took lightning to its nth degree, it can only it could only pledge 21 million coins on the Lightning Network. So, you know, as banking scaled gold, then Lightning can scale Bitcoin. But the big difference between both is that gold never had a ledger. You know, gold is a inert um, physical commodity. And so the, the ledgers had to be built on top of gold, which were done by bankers. 
so you know gold was the commodity but bankers controlled the ledgers whereas bitcoin is a digital commodity and currency but it's it also has its own set of ledgers so um light you can only build lightning on top of bitcoin as a full reserve banking concept uh, i.e you can't fractionally reserve lightning on top of bitcoin and that there's a there's a few reasons why um <clears throat> so you have um multi-sig technology which is has been a, a past upgrade to Bitcoin. So multi-sig allows you to distribute risk over more than one party, you know, which is different to banking. So you you can distribute risk between two or three parties. Then you have um, check lock time verify, which is another upgrade, which meant that you could timestamp derivatives to Bitcoin's base chain. You also have uh, check sequence verify. So then you can track timestamps, uh, um, sequences of timestamps in time. And um, there was one more thing as well, um, hash lock time contracts. So so that basically allows you chargebacks. So th 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 those four bits of technology that, that, that have been upgraded in the past, that, that basically means that um, Lightning is, you know, <coughs> completely pegged as a derivative completely pegged to the underlying scarcity of bitcoin so if there's only 21 million bitcoins there can only be ever be 21 million bitcoins pledged in a right. lightning wallet so so fractional reserve banking <laughs> you know which has has really destroyed the world it, it cannot be done with lightning because it's um it's pegged to through technology to Bitcoin's underlying scarcity. So how does that network get built out and what are some of the challenges for it to roll out so that people will use it? I mean, are there interfaces being planned? How, how is this taking off? I've seen stories where they're saying there's more and more nodes, but I haven't seen a lot of transactions other than I've seen some online where somebody does a video and it all looks very DOS where somebody fills out a transaction and says, there, I, I just did a Lightning transaction. How advanced are we on that? And how much time until the Lightning Network works for Bitcoin? And then also talk about how does it work for Litecoin and what's the interoperability between the two? Well, you know, what, what SegWit means is that you can tie derivatives to Bitcoin's base chain. So the Lightning lightning itself is a protocol which i think it was proposed in a white paper sometime in 2015 and then it's been developed from there but it's a you know um if you look at the internet you had ethernet as the base layer but the internet didn't really scale until you um got tcp ip which is you know the second layer of the internet well if you use the same um the same thing with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's base layer is the blockchain, but Lightning is a protocol on top of Bitcoin. So it's not Bitcoin, but it's right. on top of Bitcoin and it's pegged to Bitcoin. So um, I think they have got out of testnet on Lightning. So I think Lightning is live. So the, so the protocol is in place. So now it's really down to the developers to build the software on top. So I think there's um, three main companies. I think there's Async, uh, Lightning Labs, and I think there's, there's a couple more. I think there's three or four altogether. But what's the role of these companies in building out this the Litecoin network? I mean, the Lightning network? They... Well, the the the, the basic. Oh, sorry, Blockstream is another one. Yeah. So there's. Um, well, it, you know, as I say, Lightning Lightning is just a protocol. So right. It, so it, what it's are a they, protocol what are... that, that allows companies to build applications and solutions on top of it. So you know, Blockstream. Blockstream are probably the most um, advanced developer unit, really. They, they, they're not they're not just working on Litecoin, they're uh, on Lightning. They're working on side chains. They're working on drive chains. All all sorts of protocols and layers on top of Bitcoin. But 
this this protocol allows you to develop an application so you you know you're looking at the first place they're developing at the moment is there's two or three companies working on a smartphone app so you know that that's that's the most obvious place where you can build an application for the lightning network if if you can you know if you can um design something to go on a smartphone then you you, you can basically spread lightning network throughout the world there are i think blockstream are also working on um plugins for um websites and browsers so you know you could start accepting and sending bitcoin through your computer through your laptop so 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 i think that smartphones and laptops are the two most obvious places that these new companies building these applications are are working on and how developed is this system right now? I'm I'm not sure if any actual wallet has gone live yet, but you know I'd I'd expect by maybe um, next year there may be a couple of um, uh, Lightning wallets out there, but you know it's going to take time. So um, we had to piss about really for for 18 months waiting for SigWit to get activated. If it, if it had been activated from scratch, we would most likely be two years further along. But, you know, things are what they are. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's not going to happen overnight, but I think that, you know, now the, proto uh, the Lightning Protocol is here, that the incentive is now there for, for these first generation of um, companies like Async and Blockstream and uh, Lightning Labs to 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 start building, because you know it, it's not just software wallets. You're really talking about exchange interfaces, Lightning, right? Lightning scales, you know, and well, maybe not for exchanges. You know, may, maybe they don't don't want anonymity, but they're not gonna going to say no to you know zero cost inst instantaneous settlement in transactions. So you you you're going to need um, website plugins. You're going to need smartphone wallets, and you're going definitely going to need um, payment processing merchants and you know interfaces for exchanges, so you can have interchange inter exchange settlement. But aren't you also going to need people setting up these Lightning Network uh, nodes? I mean, yeah, but yeah, but it, it's it's in their interest if you understand what I mean, because you can either work on Bitcoin's base chain with its you know fee market ten minute block confirmation times and um, everything else, er, everything else, or you can develop your 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 applications working on top of Lightning. So I think you know all these new companies that are entering Bit the bitcoin space now are highly incentivized to at least allocate some of the development for these second layer solutions because I, I you know i think it's 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 in all their interest in the end but it, it it might take some time for them to figure this out so here's a question that i've heard people say that if you build out the lightning network then there's no need for a litecoin because now you can do everything with Bitcoin. Can you discuss the validity of, of that statement and then also talk about the concept of store value of Bitcoin and tie that into what the development work is between, you know, on Lightning Network and how it applies to Bitcoin and Litecoin? Yeah, there's, um, there's numerous, you know, Bitcoin maximalists, or I might call them absolutists, that mm -hmm. just think that the world revolves around Bitcoin and that everything else is a scam. They, you know, they they say that any stable coin that allows, you know, passage of money from fiat money to Bitcoin is a scam, such as Ripple or Tether or whatever. Also, you know, you hear this, you know, tired stuff about Litecoin being just another shitcoin, whereas. <laughs> You know, I, I I seriously doubt if we would have SegWit without Charlie Lee putting it on Litecoin first. But, you know, SegWit is on Litecoin as well as being on Bitcoin. So, so Litecoin has all, you know, the scaling effects that 
that Bitcoin can have. So, light, um, Litecoin can have Lightning networks. It can have you know zero cost instantaneous transactions. The, 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 these people seem to think that Lightning makes Litecoin obsolete, whereas they like I, I you know I'm I think they struggle to figure out that Lightning is also on Litecoin. So I, far from far from killing Litecoin, I think Lightning will actually weaponize Litecoin because you know, as I discussed in my post, this um, unleashes the concept of a cross atomic swap, which is basically a currency swap between blockchains. Because if you have a, a off chain derivative Lightning on both Bitcoin and Litecoin, then you can have decentralized swaps between Bitcoin and Litecoin. Litecoin through the derivatives. So, you know, I, I think that SegWit and Lightning basically ties both coins together. And it gives, in my opinion, it gives Bitcoin roughly a 4x scaling up. You know, I, I, we, we, I discussed in this first part that, you know, everything for the last few years have been geared about scaling up Bitcoin's base chain. Well, if you have Litecoin and Bitcoin connected together through derivatives, then basically you have a forex scaling up of Bitcoin's base base layer by utilizing Litecoin. I d you know, I doubt I doubt if Bitcoin will ever get that big a block size increase, you know, on on, it, on its native chain, but by by you know, just by the virtue of Lightning Networks, it means that Bitcoin and Litecoin can come into changeable assets, really. Okay, Which so... I, 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 I think is bullish for Litecoin as well, <clears throat> because it gives it gives people a reason, not an incentive, to not just accept Bitcoin, but to also accept Litecoin. Like, you know, people used gold and silver. I, I, I don't think necessarily that you just have to have one world reserve currency. You can have, well, history demonstrates that you can have at least two. Well, if you look at, and you've had, you're right, the bimetallic standards in, in many countries where you had gold was more considered the, the stable coin, and then silver was added in there to appease those who wanted to have a little inflation. Also, silver is used as a more of a transactional metal, metal than gold was, and gold was a more traditional store of the value, and then you would spend the silver. And I you know, think... You know, it's very similar. You know, Bitcoin has... Litecoin has forex the inflation that Bitcoin has. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Bitcoin definitely is the most um, stable... Uh, not stable, but the, the most secure store of value. Well, it's also in terms of volatility. Recently, it has been that too. Yeah, but you know, Litecoin, it's four. Yeah, it has four times the inflation, but it's four times faster, and it has four times the transaction capacity. So, you know, it it does mirror quite a lot gold and silver, really. That in that that gold is the, the thing used to hoard, and silver was more of the metal used to spend. Right. And I'm seeing what I'm seeing and I want to get your comment on is the move towards these Bitcoin ETFs. There's about nine of them outstanding. You have Van Neck, you have the Winklevoss twins. Coinbase is talking about maybe doing one with BlackRock. You have ProShares. That appears to be anyone who buys an ETF is looking not to take physical delivery of the underlying commodity, but looking to benefit from the value that's locked into the ETF. And if a lot of Bitcoin get bought up and put into ETFs, you won't be able to use them as a transactional currency, which would leave Litecoin as being the one that you'd have to use as a transactional currency until they catch on to that, that that's also like silver. And you can also put that into an ETF. Where do you see that uh, playing out? The A, whether we're going to get... Um, a Bitcoin ETF and what impact that would have on the entire system. And then B, after you answer that, we want to talk about uh, more conventional attempts to bring the payment process of the cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Litecoin, into the payment processing current Visa system and so on. 
Um, I think that yeah, that this is going to be the topic on my next post, by the way, in 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 the way that Bitcoin and fiat are going to, you know, they're both separate and distinct ecosystems, but they connect and they can connect through a few ways. They can connect through a centralized exchange such as Coinbase or Binance or, you know, Bitfinex or whatever. They can connect peer to peer through decentralized exchanges such as BISC and local Bitcoins used to be, I think, I think they've had um, KYC, AML regulations and since. That's, that's you, know, know your customer because the people can go on yeah, there peer to peer and trade thing. and people would know what's happening. Yeah. Um, you can have a stable coin. Tether is a is a pretty good example of that. You know, I think Tether's done a great job of bringing fiat money into the Bitcoin ecosystem and pump pump up the value of Bitcoin. But you know, everybody hates Tether. Um, Ripple is another one. So Ripple is an interbank protocol, but which allows you to transfer money from banks through Ripple to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Um, and you know. The, the first generation of exchanges were mostly retail. So you're talking Mt. Gox, you know, Coinbase and all that. They were set up for individual users to register. But now Wall Street are hovering over the, the you know, the CAC, so to speak. So I expect most of these first generation um, exchanges to shift from retail to institutional. So, you know, this is what this last few months really has been about you know i listened to a very good video of yours last night on why backed is important it it is it's and you know it, i wrote a post in june 2017 which as well as discussing the scaling debate discussed this question of how bitcoin was going to be regulated so you know um regulation on the one hand it ties you to your identity and it you know it opens you up to money laundering and taxation and all all that stuff but on the other hand regulation allows you know institutional money to come into the space right so it it, 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 it it's a balance and you know the, the most critical thing for me is are these regulated exchanges going to be fully collateralized and you know that that that's when my ears pricked up most with this backed in in that you know the futures aren't cash settled and every you know every account that's pledged has to hold the bitcoin so it's it's a custodial solution and it's basically a full reserve system if you understand what i mean because most of these first generation exchanges there were many rumors of them being fractionally reserved right. You know, um, um, Mount Cox was the obvious, obvious one. So, you know, he, he, he said for months and months, he even got Roger Ver to go on television to, to tell everybody that the Bitcoins were safe, but they were not. So, that you know, this, this takes you back to, you know, the origins of banking and when the full reserve system goes to a fractional reserve system. But as long as, you know, what I'm hoping is that this, these fully regulated exchanges will also be fully collateralized. Now, you know, I hear, I've heard in my Twitter timeline, you know, I think Mastercard has um, tried for a patent for, to fractional, fractionally reserve Bitcoin. So you had the cries from, you know, all the um, the conspiracy tads saying that our oh, Bitcoin's going to go fractional reserved. Well, maybe Mastercard is, but backed as stated that they won't. And you know, w w if we're talking about ETFs or you know pension funds or whatever, they need to know that the Bitcoin is there. Right. So you know, it, it, it has to be fully collateralized, and the, you know, they they are talking about this custodial solution because the, the 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 one difference between. <laughs> you know, the history of banking and what these exchanges are going to do with Bitcoin is that because Bitcoin is a public ledger, 
you have a, an independent way of verifying if they hold if they hold the Bitcoin, if you understand what I mean. Mm-hmm. The Bitcoin's either there on the ledger or it's not. Whereas, you know, in the history of banking, they just said that the gold was there, but it wasn't. But you can independently verify. Right. And you can also show pictures of gold. You really have to do a one by one, a save of the gold. You could, you don't even know if the gold is actually gold. You can have bars. They can have serial numbers. But like you say, on the blockchain, you can very easily determine you can't. It can't be in three different places at once. That was the whole double spending and, thing you know, that they figured and, out. And for all the talk of of the, these struggles with the custodial solutions, you know, a, a, poro, a bulletproof custodial solution in Bitcoin will cost you about a hundred bucks, which is you know a Trezor wallet or something. Right. But but there's you know there's a publicly it's it's a publicly accountable system, so. <laughs> I struggle to see where these banks and exchanges are going to be able to fractionally reserve, you know, Bitcoin, except, you know, on, on the margins. You, you, you're you bound to have, you know, a few cowboys and bad apples. But, you know, when we talk in the potential, we talk of Bitcoin as a store of value. Well, you know, and, and it's anti-correlated really to everything else in the world. Well, you think of the value of something like that to, well, we've t- we've talked about in the past central banks holding Bitcoin reserves, pension funds holding Bitcoin reserves, insurance companies holding Bitcoin reserves. You know, the, the, the potential of, you know, the potential of only 21 million Bitcoins is, you know, it, it's mind blowing really how far that it, it could develop as as a store of value, because so, you know, you know how, how how much is have you got an idea how much the pension pension industry in America is worth roughly trillions trillions, and we know the ETF business is worth uh, trillions as well. So the and thing you, is, you, you know, you know they have to try and hit the seven percent a year um, threshold right. to make sure that they they can pay out the pensions year after year after year. Well, if you have Bitcoin, say going from five thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars well that's a 20x that would be a 20x gain for any pension fund that had you know bought at one thousand and held right. until a hundred thousand and currently they can't and that's been my theory for the last couple of years now is they're looking for a way to boost returns and asset prices and you really can't continue to boost these equity prices much further bond prices real estate prices that bitcoin and others in the crypto space can actually not provide not that through return. that no. Not through that, no. but you can through equity. You know, Bitcoin is is uh, like gold. It's 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 not a debt based currency. It's a it's an asset based currency. So you, you you can get returns. You can get um, exponential returns. Well, especially on... if all of if there's this new demand which hasn't existed yet, where institutions are allowed to come in because they have the regulatory uh, go ahead that the green light that it's okay. Obviously, they're gonna they're gonna put a small percentage of their portfolios into regulated crypto and Bitcoin related investments. And as you say, if they're in ETFs, there's gonna be great demand for those ETFs to fill up the ETFs with Bitcoin. And unlike a commodity ETF, it's gonna be hard to bluff that the the Bitcoin isn't there. I mean, you could well, you could do well, that in you, gold and silver you know, ETFs. You can you can rehypothecate gold, and you can you know tell people that there are hundreds of right. millions of tons of gold out there or whatever. But you can only you know there's only 21 million Bitcoin. Well, people can see it on the block. See, the thing is with the yeah. gold, even when they audit it, they don't go bar by bar. What they do is they test a particular bar, they drill a hole in it, they look at it. But there's no way that uh, you can actually physically, you can physically do it. It's the same with the gold in Fort Knox. It would be a tremendous undertaking to go through every bar that may happen to be there. Whereas with Bitcoin, it's a lot easier to go through that uh, inventory taking. And, and, and not just that, you know, if we're talking ETFs and there's a run on an ETF, you know, either the Bitcoin's there or it's not. It's, That's it's right. Not- it's not the same as gold so you could have you you could probably run a fractional reserve etf if you wanted to but you know 
once there was any smell of you know any kind of fraud or corruption then there would be probably be a run to the the honest etfs so there's a, there's a kind of competition between honesty and and fraud right and the and other thing you, is you really it, can't rig rig the, the ledger right what you can do with a gold etf is you can remove the gold hypothecate it and then sneak it back in a year or two later and no one would know the difference you can't sneak anything around the blockchain there's going nope. to be, you're going to see it come out and then go back in and you're going to have to answer the question, why did it leave and where did it go? All right. Yep. Well, I think that's about it for today. We're going to have you back on as uh, things develop within this space. But thank you very much for joining us and, and giving us the uh, a nice detailed version of what's going on with uh, scaling and Litecoin network and a uh, lightning network. So thank you very much. And we will talk to you very soon. Thank you, Lewis. Always a pleasure. Likewise.